all that. And then there's also a schedule over there. Did we dismiss kids? Okay, let's stand together. Ephesians, a little detour this week, Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, we'll be back in uh, 1 Samuel next week. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We honor you. Be glorified here today. Not just in the place, but in each mind, each heart. Be glorified. That's what you're worthy of. And so we pray, Lord, through the study of your word, that that's exactly what would happen, that we'd be in awe of you, we'd be amazed by you, we'd have a better sense of what it is to be in you, and then we'd, we'd walk that out and live it in our lives for your glory, and we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. So there were two um, lumberjacks, I guess, that decided that they were they worked together and they were kind of rivals so they decided to have a wood chopping contest the first guy was big and buffed and burly looking like a manly lumberjack and the other guy wasn't wimpy or anything but he just wasn't compared to the other guy and so they decided to see who could chop the most wood in a long day of contest an all-day kind of long t contest and the first man the buffed guy kind of laughed to himself. There's no way this little wiry little guy is gonna outdo me. There's no way. And so they started the contest. And so they went and, and the big buff guy noticed that every 45 minutes to an hour or so that the other guy would just disappear. He'd just wander off somewhere and be gone. And he just kind of laughed and chuckled and that guy can't even handle nonstop work. He's got to take a break and there's no way he's going to beat me. He just keeps stopping. And, and it happened throughout the day. And, and at the end of the day, they compared their piles and unbelievably the smaller guy had more wood. And, and the buffed guy said, how in the world did this happen? I'm twice as big as you. I'm clearly stronger than you. And plus every hour or so you went off and took a break and would you take a nap? You must have cheated. You had to have cheated. There's no way you didn't cheat. And, and the other guy said, I didn't have to cheat and I didn't cheat. It was easy to beat you because every 45 minutes to an hour or so I went and sharpened my ax while you just kept swinging away as hard as you possibly could. And so that's how I was able to beat you. In the first half of Ephesians chapter 1, which we kinda, we're not going to study this morning, the Apostle Paul began by talking about just it, one phrase he uses there is that we've been given in Christ every, all, all riches in the heavenly places in Christ. And he talks about how much we have in all that he's done for us. And, and you can liken that to, we have been given the greatest acts there is. 
the, the resources we have, the, the blessings, what we have been given to us in Christ, you can liken it to that. We have all spiritual blessings that heaven has to offer. We have the promise of holiness. We have the we're predestined to be adopted sons. We have redemption. We have forgiveness. We have understanding. We have, we have the seal of the Holy Spirit guaranteeing that it's all going to be uh, realized ultimately. And, that, and so we're truly wealthy people as Christians. If you're a believer, you have all this. It's, it's given to you. And so it's like having the best possible acts. But someone with the best acts still has to know how to use it they still need to know how to what it is to have that axe and what it means that you have that tool and 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 in a manner of speaking so then we have to keep it sharp and and keeping it sharp isn't like the work so much of the guy had to take a break and sharpen his axe but it's more a lot it can be more likened to we need to know who we are we need to know what we have and know who we are and 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 as much as we need to we need to go and take that time and Get away from just working and go and make sure we, we remember who we are, what we have, and, and all that kind of stuff. And if we don't, it'll, we'll be like that other guy. We'll have all this resource and, and not getting much accomplished, and we'll, tire, and we'll even tire out because we'll have to get, well, it, to get anything done. We'll have to go harder and harder and harder and harder. And so um, there's some certain things as it relates to the Christian life that the Apostle Paul talks about here that you can call it a sharpening of the axe or you can call it Things we just need to get real. We need to realize them more. We just need to realize them more. They're already true. We need to realize them. So verse 15, he starts off and says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. And the church in Ephesus had a good spiritual reputation. The apostle Paul had heard of them. He heard about their faith. And that's good. But he also heard something else about their, uh, along with their faith. He, it says, I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. They loved each other. This church loved each other. And, they didn't, and, and he didn't only hear about how they, you know, believed in Jesus, but he also heard about how they loved each other. In uh, John 13, 35, of course, Jesus said, this is how everybody will know you're my disciples when you have love for each other. And so the, the, the love that these believers had flowed from their faith in Jesus. That the, the love that true believers in Jesus has is expressed towards each other like no other love that there is in the world. And when someone really trusts Jesus, they're going to love people. And they're going to love the people that Jesus loves. Galatians uh, 5.22 says that the fruit of the Spirit is love. So that's what will grow out of your life if you have a regular, vibrant relationship with God. It, it, that's what will grow, love. And, and obviously that's what the Apostle Paul had heard about. He heard about that in this church, that these believers didn't just, you know, they weren't just churchgoers. They were people that loved each other, and it showed. And, and probably the kind of love that's described in 1 Corinthians 13, where love is patient, it's kind, it's not rude or self-seeking or any of those other things. It doesn't keep records of wrongs. And, 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 and that's, what he, that's what he was seeing in this group of believers, this church. And, and they, they trusted each other and they believed in Jesus. Or, I mean, they trusted in Jesus and they loved each other. And, and, you know, some things just go together, right? Bacon and eggs peanut butter and jelly, <laughs> potato chips on a tuna fish sandwich, <laughs> fireworks on the 4th of July, foot, watching football and guacamole, just some things just <laughs> go together. And trusting Jesus goes hand in hand with unconditional love, with lo learning how to love people. If we have faith, we ought to have love. If we don't have love, there's something wrong with the faith. And, and, and the love that we have should be for the people of God. The, these are people that have exactly the same thing you have. They're a sinner who, by the grace of God, got forgiven, got invited into and put into his family. And, and these are people that he did that. He loved them so much, he died for them. It doesn't even make sense that we wouldn't love people that have, have received the same thing as us. And so what other attitude could we have? If he loves us, if he loves them, we should too. And, and if, if we're missing that, then we got a dull ax. We're not realizing what we need to realize as believers. And then he says, 
When I heard about all that, verse 16, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now, this is awesome. Uh, one of the awesome examples that Paul, the Apostle Paul gives us, all kinds of examples he gives us, the way, he, the kind of relationship, the walk that he had. But his, his, his uh, example here is he heard about their faith and his heart was to pray for them when he heard about it and to tell them that he was praying about praying for them. I've been praying for you guys all the time, constantly. I've been thanking God for you. I've been lifting you up to him. And, and, and he begins, so he says, I, uh, I, I don't cease to give thanks for you. The very first thing that he prays, the very first thing that he prays, he says, is I'm, I give thanks to God for you. Thank you, Lord, that these people heard the gospel and they believed it. Thank you for saving them. Thank you that they love each other. And then, and then from there, he also interceded for them. He, he was lifting them up to the Lord. Now, probably everybody in here, maybe not, but probably everybody in here prays at least sometimes, at somewhat, in some degree, and in some way. And, and some of us, you know, and one of the major things that we typical pray, typically pray for are the people that we love and care about and our family and, and, and ourselves. I, I pray for myself a lot. I'm sure you do too. And, and, but then we also pray for those that, um, if we know the Lord, we're going to pray for those that don't. We're going to pray that they would. You parent, you know, child, friend, co-worker, family member. They don't know Jesus. And you, we, you just know, because you do, you know they're missing out. You just know they're missing out. And not only that, but you're concerned about their eternity. And so you pray for them. You pray, Lord, save them, open their eyes, help them to, help them to see what we see, help them to know how good you are. There's no way that if they knew how good you are, they wouldn't believe you. So soften their hearts, open their eyes, and we pray that kind of stuff. And the Apostle Paul did that. He prayed in Romans that my heart's desire and pray to God for Israel is that they'd be saved. I want the, my, my country people, my, my fellow Jews, I want them to be saved. And, and, but then even after they came to faith, the Apostle Paul kept praying for them. And he said, I'm always praying for you. And that's a really good idea. We need to do that. We could do that. As Christians, we're glad for any and all praise, someone pr prayer, anyone prays for us. We're glad somebody prayed for us before we were believers. I know I am. I know at least one person that was praying for me before I started walking with the Lord. I'm so thankful for her. And, and, and we're glad about that. But we're also, even after you're saved, you're glad when someone tells you, I've been praying for you. You know, I love that. Thank you. Whoever's praying for me, please keep doing it. It's working. It really is. Really. It really is. And, and, and even if, you know, you've been walking for, with the Lord for years, and to have to pray for each other, and, and it's an important way to keep sharp, to keep effective, to realize who I am and what I am as a Christian. I'm somebody that can talk to God on behalf of other people, and it's effective. It actually helps. And, and so, so then the rest of the passage is what he prayed for them. And this is one of the great prayers in the New Testament. It's an awesome prayer. It's a prayer that, you know, we can take the points that he pr prays for. And I do. Often I take them and I pray the same thing for others and for myself. And, and basically, it's, it, if you want to summarize what they all are, but we're going to go through them, the summary of what they all are is he's praying that these believers would have a greater realization of what they have as Christians. You have all this, and you need to know it better. Because you can have a lot of stuff and not realize how good you have it. And Christians are no different. These spiritual blessings we have, these things that we have at our disposal, are so great. They're so amazing, the, what God has given us. And, and so he's like, I'm so glad you're saved. Thank God for that. I'm glad you guys love each other, but I'm praying that you get this too. How good you have it, the resources you have. And so verse 17 says, he, he says, if I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And so he prays here, he shows how deep and specific prayer can be. Because when he says, I'm praying for you, he doesn't just go, I, I, uh, and God bless the church in Ephesus, and God bless the, bless the church in Corinth. There's nothing wrong with that brief kind of prayer. I don't want to put that down at all. 
if that's how you pray, pray that. But you actually can go deeper too. You can take it further, you can be more specific, you can give, you can lift up more details when you see what needs people have. And that's what the Apostle Paul said. He realized that I want to pray something specific for them. You know what the benefit of praying specifically is? You see God doing stuff specifically. If you pray God bless them, it's hard to gauge that. And there's nothing wrong with praying God bless them, but it's hard to gauge that. And it's good to be able to gauge answered prayer because it encourages us to pray more. So learn how to pray specifically. Learn how to pray for specific things. You know, I pray specifically for my kids. I pray specific things that I see that they would benefit from and they need. And, and I'm so glad because I, can, I see it happen. And, and so he prays specifically. He prays, Lord, give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Wisdom is, generally speaking, the, the understanding of what to do, what's right, how to do what's right. And then revelation, revelation is how God shows truth to us, how he shows truth and to sinners and to people. And so, and he's given, and he has three great ways that he does it. There's, there might be more, but the three main broad areas in which God gives revelation to people is nature or creation. And through creation, God reveals to us that he exists, that he's amazing, that he's powerful, that he loves beauty, that he loves order, that, and he's mighty. And you can see that just from looking at the world around you. You look at it, look at the universe. You can look at the stars and you go, that's amazing. It's mighty. It's powerful. It's beautiful. It's extremely orderly. Wow. And then the, uh, another, another area of revelation, of course, is the Bible. And the Bible tells us more about God personally, personality wise, as it were, or, you know, or it tells us that he's holy, that he's concerned with holiness, that he's concerned with justice, that he's patient so you know justice sometimes is slow in coming because if it wasn't we'd all be done every single one of us but but he's just and he's personal and that and so that gives us more revelation you can't figure that kind of stuff out from looking at the stars so he gave us a different revelation and then he gives us the revelation of the greatest revelation is in jesus that he we see in jesus exactly what god's like it, the bible says he's the exact representation of god and so we see his great love and, and the, the person of Jesus intensely amplifies and clarifies all the other revelation. And so the Apostle Paul says, I'm praying all the time that you would know Jesus better. You would know God better. Give them that ability to know this in their relationship with you. Give them the ability to learn more of you. And that's an awesome prayer. Here we are. We have a relationship with God. And every relationship the better you know somebody, the deeper the relationship is. If you know them better and then you maintain the relationship, the, the relationship becomes better. And here, and, and that's what God wants for us. There's no, there's no person we can know like God. He's holy. He's so holy that angels who've been with him forever and ever, you know, they've been around with him for millions of years and eternity still say every day, holy, holy, holy. There's the, they didn't run out of holiness to say to him because he's still holy to them. They didn't get so familiar with him that they're like, yeah, we've been calling him holy for a while. I mean, okay, we get it. No, they're still amazed. And, and, and so there's no one like God, and, and we want to know how to have that relationship with him. We want to know how it's done. Now, if you're getting married, you know, you're young and you're getting married, it's, you know, maybe if, you're, if you have any sense or wisdom, you want to hear from people that have been doing marriage for a while. You know, you want to hear from them like, you know, you want to hear from your parents or maybe your grandparents or some some couple that's been married for, you know, a good long time. So they can they can speak to it. You know, they know what to say. They can give you nuggets and wisdom and truth. And and uh, if you're smart, you'll listen. And Paul, by saying this and praying, this is he's somebody who's had a lot of experience walking with the Lord. And, and, and so he's, he knows what they would benefit from knowing and what they would benefit from receiving. And so that's why he's praying this. He's, he's just praying, God, help them to know how to have a strong walk with you. Show them how they can know you better and better. That's what they need. 
They need that. Every one of us needs that. And, 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 who, and so there's no one, none of us that don't need that. And that's what God wants for us. He wants us to know how to know him better. And, and here's the thing. Some people know a lot about other people. Some people are really good at like knowing all the, all the sports figures. I mean, you could just name them off. They know the statistics. They know it. You know, they could just who's making what and who plays for who and how many home runs and how many yards and all these different things. And they just people are good. They're on top of it. They know all that kind of stuff. Or the actors. They know all the actors. They know who's been in what movies and how many movies and who, what, who directed and who produced and who won the, this award and that award. And they know all that kind of stuff and all these types of things. And when, when Paul prays that we would know God better, he doesn't want us to know just that kind of stuff. He wants us to know him the way we would know a great friend. What, what he thinks, what he's like, what he'd do, what's his heart. And, and that's what his heart is. He, he, would, he, he prays that we do more than just have a relationship that's based on memorized, recited, rep repetitive prayers. And, and but getting into those subjects of our lives that matter and are ultimate. God says, I want you to know I will listen to anything. You know how we know that? Read the Psalms. He, God will listen to anything you have to say to him. There's nobody else in this world that will listen to anything that you say. <laughs> Try it. You won't have any friends. It'll be real fast. You'll be, you'll be all alone. If you just say everything that's in your mind, you, you will be all alone. But God will listen to anything you have to say. And he wants you to know that. And he also wants you to know, but I also want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to me. And so Paul knows that about God, so he prayed it for believers. And, and, and then it continues, verse 18, the, the, he prays that the eyes of your understanding should be, would be enlightened. That's a cool phrase. Other, other translations say that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. And we have an old, you know, an older worship song from, I don't know, 25, 30 years ago or something. I don't know how old that song is. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. It's a good song. And, and there's such a thing as head knowledge, and there's such a thing as heart knowledge. Head knowledge is intellectual, academic type of knowledge. It's, it's kind of like storing of information, right? You, it's stuff that you can recite or recall you know, passwords. I mean, that doesn't qualify. Nobody can remember all their passwords, huh? But you know, you're, I don't even know. You lose it when you get older, I suppose. Because <laughs> so, I can't even think of an example right now. But you know, and Paul, Paul, but Paul prayed for something more than that, something deeper. He asked God to open the eyes of their hearts. The deeper part of you, where knowing there means that you're convinced and moved about it. It's not just something you can regurgitate and recite. And, and it isn't God's intention that our relationship with him is limited to being able to recite, properly recite doctrines or being able to uh, appropriately win an argument or a debate about theological issues. You know, that we can put a, a cultist in, a, in their corner, you know, doctrinally or something like that. It's good to be able to do that. Hopefully we can do that. But that's not the limit. His, that's not his chief interest, that we would be able to win a debate on, you know, our view of the end times or something like that. He wants the truth to filter down into our hearts so that what we know about him is deeper it's moving us, it's comforting us, it gives us peace and joy. It makes us amazed because we're in awe of him because he's so amazing. And so we, it, it makes it so that we can't wait to worship. We can't wait to pray. We can't wait to get together with other believers. And maybe you know that high blood pressure is bad for you. You know, maybe you know that, that if you have high blood pressure, you're at higher risk for things like stroke and heart attack and things like that. Maybe you know that. That's intellectual academic knowledge. Then the doctor tells you that you have high blood pressure. It, now it's going to probably, hopefully, that information is now greater, 
deeper. It's going to hopefully move you. And, and, and it's in your heart so that now you want to act and take action. And Paul, that's what Paul's praying for believers. I want your knowledge of Jesus to be like that. Something that moves you, stirs you, riles you up, you know. And, and then he goes on to speak of three things that we need to know in our hearts. Because he prayed that you'd have the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened so that these three things would really sink in. Verse 18 says that you may know what is the hope of his calling. So the first thing that he wants us to really get is what we need to know the, know the hope of God's calling, hope in our hearts. The Bible says that as believers, we've been called. You become a believer because God called you to himself. He called you. He called you to come and be saved from your sins. He called you to come and be in his family. He called you to come and have a relationship with him. He called you out of darkness, the darkness of the sinful, selfish life. He called you out of that sin into a life of holiness. He called you from death to eternal life. That's the greatest calling there is. Nobody could call you to anything greater than that. And, and, it's, and that calling is full of hope. Because he says, I want you to know what is the hope of that calling, his calling. So what's hope? Well, biblical hope is different than what's usually the way that hope, the word hope is typically used. The, typically, it has some element or degree of wish, and it may, and it may or may not happen. You know, that's, that's the worldly version of hope. But, but biblical hope is an anticipation. It's a confident, confident expectation. It's a certainty that I don't have it yet, but I will because it's in the future. It, when you're a kid, little kids don't go, I hope Christmas comes. They go, when Christmas comes, and that's why they're excited, because they know it will. They know Christmas will come. And that's kind of the idea of biblical hope. This salvation that we have in Jesus, it's, it's, it's a... The, this gospel, that's the kind of hope it is. That's what it's supposed to be. That's why he's, and, and, but because it's, we don't all think of it that way, he prays it. He prays that they would know it that way, that we would know this calling like that. That we wouldn't be like, man, I hope I make it. I don't know if I'm going to make it. Is God really going to forgive me? Am I really going to go to heaven? He's praying, man, I want you to, I want that to be, you need to have that settled that Jesus didn't go to the cross just so that you might go to heaven and, and that you might have eternal life. And he wants us to have that because that's the greatest way to get through life. When you're, when you're uh, I remember being a senior in high school and you, that senioritis, and remember that? You're like, you just, I just can't, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And then like, you're, you got like, uh, Finals, and that's like, ugh, finals. But you could make it through the finals because right after the finals, the hope. And it wasn't a hope like, maybe we'll have summer vacation this year. It was a hope. It was this kind of biblical hope. It was like, we're having summer vacation this year. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to it. I'll get through the dumb finals, and, and I'm going to get there. And... And it made it bearable. That hope made it bearable. God wants to, us to live the Christian life like that, with that great assurance of hope. To, to, to be, to, and, and, and it to be like to, so that we can look at anything that we face in this world, anything that comes our way, anything, and, and be able to go, but afterwards. This is as bad as it gets. And then Glory afterwards. Jesus did that. It says in uh, Hebrews 12, it says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He despised the shame. But then because of the joy set before him, and afterwards he sat down at the right hand of God. And that's us. So that, to, so that through that we have, we're done with every thought that would tempt us to think this is it, this is, there's, nothing's going to change, it'll never get better. That's just a lie. It's not true. Any expression, any like 
thinking or talk that we have that's like that is just revealing that we need to know the hope of his calling better. We clearly don't. If we can bemoan and think nothing will ever change, that's miserable. And so we, we need that. And, and we know how to do that because we, we, we often put our hope in such lesser things, right? We put our hope in vac vacation. We put our hope in a pay raise. We put our hope in a new purchase or, a, you know, we put our hope in all kinds of stuff. But Peter said in 1 Peter that we're to rest our hope fully on the grace that is to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Put it all there. Don't divide it up. You know, I'll put a little bit of hope in vacation because I really like that. That gets me through too. Put it all in Jesus. Put all of it there. In what happens when he comes back? In what happens when you get to be with him? Put it all there. And that's why this, the uh, hymn, our hope is to be built on nothing less than Jesus' love and, and righteousness. It's Jesus' blood and righteousness. Holy lean on Jesus' name. And, and the psalmist knew how to do that too because he was struggling down and he talked to himself, and you can do that, talk to yourself, but talk to yourself biblically if you're going to talk to yourself. Yeah. Because he said, why are you cast down, oh my soul? Why are you so upset? Hope in God. He told himself that. That's the right way to talk to yourself. And, and we're supposed to, so we're supposed to pass through this life with, the, with that, with that thrill of hope, eternity with God, so much that we can get through stuff. So that even though we still face trials, because that's not part of the gospel. The gospel, part of the gospel is not, now that you're a Christian, it's all going to be smooth sailing from here on out. That is not part of the gospel. If you hear someone who says they're representing God and is teaching the Bible and says any kind of that stuff, leave and go find somewhere else to listen to, because that's not the gospel. But the gospel is, this is as bad as it'll get, and the gospel is that that we have a hope that can't be diminished at all, despite all that. And, and so uh, Paul's saying, that's what you need. I'm praying that you'll have that. And then secondly, we need to know in our hearts how much God treasures us. There also in verse 18, it says, he wants us to know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. There are some phrases in the Bible that are so amazing, it'd be ridiculously presumptuous for us to just say this is what's true of God unless it was in the Bible. And this is one of them, I think. That this one says that we are God's inheritance, and, and it's, not a, it's not the kind of inheritance where you're like, that's all I get, and you just throw it away. That, that, we are, that we are the riches of, we, God gets riches of glory of inheritance in us. It, you would think it would say, we're God's inheritance and what a bum deal he gets. That's what you would think. That's what makes more sense. But that's not what it says. It says, we are God's inheritance. We are God's riches. Now, the Bible says in, in Ephesians 1, 11, that we have an inheritance. So we, we do get, we get an inheritance. And that, that we're glad for. And we can kind of see that because we can see God's so good. But then here it says that we are his inheritance. And that what he inherits in us is a wealth of glory, riches of glory in us. He gets all kinds of glory in us as believers. How? How in the world does that happen? I haven't watched it in a long time, but I used to love to watch uh, this old house. I just love watching uh, restoration like that. Some people like to watch cars, you know, cars. I love that, too. There's a... Uh, kid that was on our kids swim team and they live around the corner from us and the the dad they have a you know he helped he taught his son and so they restored a car and now the kid has a car and then he has another car it's awesome they're just amazing these old cars and they're just it's beautiful like you know most most cars end up in the junkyard they do most of them do 
and but these are restored and it's and and a lot of times the restoration is better better than it ever was even originally when it came off the you know assembly line and you're like wow that's awesome and then you're impressed by the person that could do that and not only that but the person who did it is also blessed by it they're they're amazed by it they they're 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 it pleases them and it impresses everybody about the person who can do such a thing and they value that work because they're go i know what i'm gonna they they can they can see the treasure before it's done they go find the clunker in the junkyard and they go i know exact that's exactly what i've been looking for that it's all rusty and yeah because i know exactly what i'm going to do with it and and as that's what god does and that's why he gets glory in us not because there's any glory but because he's going to pour he's going to restore us he's going to remake us he's going to renew us he's going to do a renovation where we're better than we're going to be better than adam and eve were when they were made that's that's the truth that's what the bible teaches they were made they were made innocent we're going to be made righteous that's better and so we're we're going to be his master work we're his praise when we get to heaven and this talks about this in chapter two for all of eternity the angels are going to every time they see us they're going to be like wow that guy wow her him because I remember seeing them on earth and it was not pretty. <laughs> Look at them now. God, you're so amazing. You're so awesome what you did. And, and, and when we know that, when we know that that's how God feels about us and he treasures us that way, it gives us assurance about his commitment to us because, you know, we might be the kind of people that start a project and then give up and, you know, lose interest and get sidetracked. But God's not like that. He's going to finish the work. And it also greatly encourages us that we're not worthless. If the, if the God of the universe says, I can do something with that person, then he can do something with us. And it also purifies us to know that this is how he thinks of us and what he's doing. Because... Think about the guy again who's restoring a car. If you know that you have a friend and he's restoring this car and he's really good at it and you know he's going to get it done, you don't walk up to that car and go, well, it doesn't matter how I, what I do around this car because he's going to fix it anyway. You don't go, it's okay if I scratch it because he's going to fix it anyway. It's okay if I dent it because he's going to fix it anyway. No, quite the opposite. You go, man, he's going to, he's going to make this thing that's already a piece of junk so amazing that I'm going to respect that mm -hmm. and honor that. And I want to see it. And so in the same way, God's going to do something with us. That's his plan. He's going to make us into something amazing. So we don't go, so it doesn't matter what I do, because he's just going to fix me anyway. We go, oh man, I, I, I want to see that finished product. So it purifies us to know that. And, and it's, so it's good. He says, I, you, you got to know how much he, what he has in mind, how he treasures you, the glory he's going to get. And then thirdly, we need to know in our hearts how much power there is for us. Verse 19 says, He's praying that what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. One of the things that makes the Christian life and the Christian faith so much better and different than any other life and faith there is, besides the fact that it's true, <laughs> is that it offers power. It offers power. So many other beliefs, all of them, tell you what to do. They tell you what to do. Here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to do. If you want to make it this way, you need to do this and that. You need to do all this stuff. And you better not fail. You need to do it. You know, work hard. All this stuff. But it doesn't take long in any of those for people to realize, no matter how hard I try, I keep blowing it. And then I got to start over. And I, I never know where I'm at. I don't think I can do it. And none of them give assurance either that you will make it. It's just work your hardest and hope for the best. Mm. But the, 
the, the gospel gives us power. And it, it, so we're not left hopeless and helpless and wondering. It gives us power, an exceeding amount of power available to us in Jesus. And so the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he's praying that we'd know that. And he talks here about the kind of power it is. It's a threefold power. There's three elements of it in this passage. First of all, we have resurrection power. It says there, uh, again, verse 19, what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the same kind of power as the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. It's resurrection power. Think about the death of Jesus for a minute. Jesus was tortured, tortured. He was scourged. That typically was 40 lashes with this crazy cat of nine tails whip and tore him up. Brutally assaulted over and over so that there was, you know, he was on the doorstep of death just from that. And then he got nailed to a cross and he died. And then for three days, he got put into a tomb, and the tomb was the tomb that they did, that there was the types of tombs, and the type of tomb Jesus was in was a kind of, where they, it was a kind of a hole in a rock cave, and then they put a huge stone in front of it that, you know, no, it would take a number of strong, healthy men to, to move. And then, there, and then some armed guards just for extra measure. There, there's no more hopeless situation than that. It's over. It's over. And, but then the power of God came, and he came back to life, and he came out of the tomb. And the thing is, is that we're not talking about a near-death experience. We're not talking about somebody who's on the operating table that flatlines for a minute, but then because of great, you know, medical technology and you know defibrillators and all these different types of things that and 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 machinery and medical science is is you know the heartbeats brought back and and then through uh, a, a lengthy hospital stay and some physical therapy and rehabilitation now they're back to health and he was brought back to a more powerful life than he had before in a moment, in a moment. A life that death can't touch, it lasts forever. And, and that was the power of God that did that. And he says, the Apostle Paul says, I'm praying that you would know that's the kind of power that works in you as a believer. That's what it does, that's the same way, you have that. Nothing else can account for us being saved in the first place. Some of us just were so familiar with what we were, like, you know, it just comes out sometimes. We talk about like, oh yeah, I remember when I did that. What a bonehead, you know. Mm -hmm. And, it, and it, wasn't look, it wasn't like I decided one day to turn over a new leaf. That's not what happened. It's not like I decided one day that, you know, by the power of positive thinking, I'm going to go from being a, you know, foul mouth, fornicating, lying, arrogant, whatever, violent dude. I think I'm going to go and do religion now. That's not what happened. You know, it, it wasn't any of that. It was because... You're dead in trespasses and sins. I mean, you're buried in it. You're, you can't get out of that on your own. But by this very power of God, the same power of God that raised Jesus from the dead, he, he gave you a whole new life, totally new life. And, and so that's what we have. And if you're saved, you know that. Hopefully you know that. But he says, I want you to know it better. I want it to be down and sink in your heart so that no matter what happens in life, you don't ever see any situation as hopeless. Because if you got saved, anything else is possible. And, and the God who raised Jesus from the dead, that's what he has for you. And then next we have ascension power there in verse 20, the second part, it says, and, and he seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. When Jesus rose, he ascended into heaven. He overcame the restraints of this earth. You ever seen the amount of power it takes for a rocket to launch into space? It's, it's amazing. It's impressive. The amount of power just to escape Earth's gravity, right? 
But even that isn't enough because then once you're up there, you still need power to sustain you up there. You can't, it's not like you could get out of the rocket and go, oh, this is cool, I'm gonna fly around in space now. You, you, you don't have enough power to do that. You can't get out of Earth, you can't live outside of Earth. It, there's two, you can't do it. We, and we can't even get that far from Earth. I mean, is, is the moon the furthest a human's ever been? I guess, right, right? That's the first we've ever been? That's nothing. The next closest star is four light years away. Four light years at the speed of light. So we, we're, we're stuck. We're stuck here. We don't have the power to get ourselves. We don't have the power to lift ourselves up over the, with our own bootstraps or anything like that. And, but Jesus went beyond the confines of this physical universe. He went into heaven. We don't have any idea what that takes, but he did it. And, and God says, yeah, that same power is available to you. You know, the same working of him when he was raised from the dead and seated at his right hand in the heavenly places. And, and so again, he wants us to know that so that we don't go, man, I'm just sunk too low. I can't get out. I'm just too low. I can't go any higher. I, I'll never reach bottom and I'm just going to keep sinking. And, and he's like, and you need to know that that is not how it works for you as a believer. Don't think like that. The, you're, we're supposed to say, I can do all things through, through him who gives us strength. And we're supposed to be able to take, and it, it, most of us know that verse, so know this one too. The, say that. Say this about yourself. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead can raise me out of this pit, this hole, this darkness, this struggle, this whatever. He, he can. He can raise me. He can, he can have me ascend out of this sin that I am stuck in. And, and Paul says, this isn't just power of positive thinking. This is believing the truth. And then thirdly, we have conquering power. Verse 21, far above all principality and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet. Jesus wasn't just abused by Roman soldiers who put him on the cross. Jesus was attacked by all the powers of hell more than anyone else ever has been. And it doesn't say this, but it's not, it's probably not a stretch to imagine that when he was on the cross, hell must have just been laughing, celebrating. We got him. We got him in this apparent victory on the cross. But he rose and he ascended, and now he's ex exalted higher than all of that. They're, they're his footstool, his footrest, you know, he props his feet up on him. And, and, and he has the most exalted name anyone has ever had in human history. Not every single person on earth knows the name Jesus, but more people know the name Jesus than any other name that's ever been known. And someday every name will know, and not only know, but every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And, and this was a poor carpenter who preached in obscure villages 2,000 years ago. He never wrote a book. He never traveled more than maybe 120 miles he didn't have a PR team. He didn't have a publicist. He didn't have a podcast. He didn't have a YouTube channel. He didn't have billboards. He didn't have, you know, billboards on the freeway. He didn't have all the political signs during voting seat. Vote for me, for Messiah. He didn't have any of that. No TV, no radio, no internet. And, and he upset and conquered all the powers of hell and now he has the most glorious name that's ever been known on earth. Can you, I, I, I was thinking about this when I, last night when I shared, I, I talked, I had a little thing where I was talking about how many, the, from like the 60s all the way till now, somebody, somebody did a study and like 60% of all songs that are written are about love or relationships. I don't, somebody did this study. I'll bet the number of songs written about Jesus is so much more than that. So much more than that. We're still, there's still new songs being sung about him. 
no one is as famous as Jesus. And not only that, but then, you know, his enemies are a footstool. There, I remember one year there was this kid in school and he was bullying this other kid. And he was like kind of a big, strong, and he was a soccer player, a little bit muscular. And the other kid was also a soccer player, but he, he just didn't look like much. He just didn't. He just... You know, all you could do is just, uh, what a jerk, that's a shame, kind of thing. And, and one day, I think the name's kid was Colin. One day, Colin surprised everybody. <laughs> and that dude didn't pick on anybody else anymore after that. Yeah. And I think it actually happened twice. The guy was so stupid, he couldn't, you know, he came back for more and got, he got beat up twice, I'm pretty sure. And, and the enemy is a bully, and sin wants to be a tyrant over you. And the power of God revealed in Jesus, the conqueror he's available to. And the Apostle Paul here says, our, our great need is not that God would give us some power. Our great need is to know that he already has. He already has. He is not praying, God, give them power. He is praying, God, help them to know the power that's already available to them. This mighty power. And again, so that we'll never have to wallow in. I, I'll, never, I'll never stop this. I'll never overcome this. I'll never have more faith. I'll never be a better witness. I'll never serve more. I'll never have a better marriage. I'll never conquer my fear. God's like, you, got, you have power. You just need to learn how to appropriate it. Learn how to believe that it's true. Appropriate it. Use it. There's power for you. We are not hopeless. We are not worthless. We are not powerless. And, and then finally, we need to know he is ours and we are his. Verse 22, the second part says, And he gave him, God gave him, Jesus, to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So here it says that God gave the one who is head over all. The church has a head. It's not the pastor, it's not, the head is the, of the church is Jesus Christ. And, and that means he's ours. He's our head, he's our Lord, he's our king, he's our leader. He's, he's the head. And we can get that, because of all we already know about him. But then what it says, it says another one of those mind-boggling things, one of those things that you're like, if this wasn't in the Bible, I wouldn't dare say this. It says, we are his body and we are the fullness of him. And to make it more mind-boggling, he says, we're the fullness of him who fills everything. He fills everything, and we're his fullness. What? That's what it says. We're his body. We are the expression, the action of Jesus. The way he loved. The way he showed grace. The way he showed mercy. He preached the way he, Jesus was a preacher. He was a preacher first and foremost. It's the first thing he did. Jesus wasn't a miracle worker who preached. He was a preacher who did miracles. And, and, and now we're that. We're, we're the expression of Jesus in this world. The, whole, the Holy Spirit was in him, and then he left, and then he sent his Holy Spirit into us. He said, you need me to go, because if I don't go, then the Holy Spirit won't come on you. So now we're the expression of of Jesus in this world. And, and, and again, that would be a ridiculous idea if it wasn't in the Bible. That would be a ridiculous idea if we had to do it on our own. But because he's called us that, because he's glorified in us, because he gets riches of glory through this happening, because he's given us his power, and because he's the head, we can, we can be that. We're the expression of Jesus on this earth. We're supposed to be his hands, his feet, his mouth, his heart. He's the head. He directs. We move. And, and again, if all that was just, here's what you guys need to do, and that was it, it'd be laughable. It'd be, it'd be like, yeah, that's not going to happen. It wouldn't, go, it wouldn't go on for two minutes. But, but he said, but you have my spirit. I have, I've given you all these things. I've given you all this riches from heaven. And so you, you can. 
And so, Christians, we sharpen our axe by, we make sure that we're able and effective by knowing what we have, first part of Ephesians 1, knowing who we are, what God has done for us, believing it, and if, if, you, if it's still hard, then just keep praying it in. The Apostle Paul prayed it in. And, have, and ask God to move us. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Praise you. Honor you. Glory to you, Lord. Glory to you. And may our lives bring you glory as you intend. Help us, Lord, to know what we have, to know who we are, and to live like that's true. We love you, we praise you, in Jesus' name, amen.